Welcome to Vancouver's first and only unapologetically progressive public affairs program with your hosts, David Benedictus and Daria Ruggles. Good morning. My name is David Benedictus. Welcome to Coacoob. And I'm Daria Ruggles. Welcome back. And this morning, we're talking with Robert Lacoste, who is an instructor in the technology and web development departments at Clark College, and he specializes in UX strategies, that's user experience strategies. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We're very um, happy to have you. Yeah, really glad to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk about what I do and, and how you might get involved with it and, and in Vancouver and also what it might mean for our city. Go for it. That's exactly, let's, let's, let's start right there. First of all, why don't you give us a little understanding of what user experience is and how people can get a cool career in technology and, and, and not have their job disrupted right here in Vancouver, Washington with you. It's happening right here in Vancouver, <laughs> Washington at Clark College, too. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah, so uh, I can start this, off, start this off with a high-level definition. So user experience, um, which is often abbreviated as UX, um, is, to sum it up, the quality of experience a person has when interacting with a specific design. And that design could be analog, it could be uh, it could be digital, or it could even be more nebulous, like a process. Mm -hmm. So, a product or a service, and it, that we all use. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and I and to to uh, make this relevant to Vancouver. So, I teach UX design at Clark College. Um, it's uh, as as David mentioned, it's part of the uh, part of the technology program. And it's, we encourage everyone in the Graph Design Associates uh, track and the Web Development Associates track to, uh, to take this class. So what kind of people can take this? Say, say somebody that's watching us out there right now on, on our Open Signal channels, it feels like, hey, you know, I have no idea what this is. I mean, maybe I'm not smart enough. How much education do I need? What is the bar for people learning and user experience with you and actually being able to do something with it and earn a living? Great question. Um, so I can I can speak to this uh, at, at the uh, most essential nuts and bolts level first. Um, if you want to take this course at Clark College, um, and especially if you already have, say, an associate's or a bachelor's degree, it is as simple as enrolling at Clark. Uh, and I believe they're they're pretty open minded with regard to who can enroll and at what cost right now. Um, and then you just sign up for the class, and if for any reason there's a wait list. Usually I overload my class because my class usually tops out and there usually is a wait list, but I'm happy to go a couple extra people per term just to make this as, as accessible as possible. Because I feel this has a lot of good in it, um, a lot of good for everyone involved. Now to speak to your question about what does it take to get into UX? And there's a lot of people um, who are very eager to get into UX right now. Hmm. Um, among other things you'll see are a lot of boot <coughs> programs. Um, and what do we mean by a boot camp? We mean a, in some cases, a uh, two month to six month to maybe even 12 month program um, that is focused on just delivering the essentials to enable you to create common artifacts used uh, in user experience design um, and understand the course core concepts. Now let's talk about the let's talk about the precursors or the the prerequisites that you might consider um, before, say, pursuing this this line of thinking or line of uh, line of academic pursuit or professional pursuit. Now, really, user experience is all about talking to people. So that's that's pretty much the core of it: talking to people and being an active listener, and not just talking at people, but but offering them provocative uh, kernels, provocative cues, prompts. Um, to elicit a type of feedback that ideally uh, draws more from the back brain memory lobe um, rather than the I'm just going to fill it in without realizing it cognitive lobe. So it's all about storytelling, um, pulling stories out of people, listening to their stories, uh, finding the nuggets that might that they might not know how to articulate outside of a story context and then running with those little nuggets to say, uh, create, 
create a design of a thing that perhaps makes their lives better, perhaps makes their customers' lives better. Um, it, it really is about improving the human condition through active listening and storytelling. Mm -hmm. So how many classes do people have to take in that uh, time frame you mentioned in order to get out there and do this? In, in the boot camps, it's usually um, one continuous program. So, so it's not really divided into uh, classes. Um, but it's one continuous program. And for the six month programs out there, it's usually um, in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 hours a week. Um, so you'll, you'll get a robust education. You'll get, I mean, if you devote yourself to it, you will come out of most of those boot camps understanding how to talk to people, how to do informed research, and then how to take the learnings uh, and insights out of that research and then spin it into a design that then can be presented and moved into a development pipeline. And the point of this being, Robert, that it's such a ubiquitous and necessary thing that people are going to find the work, right? Um, yeah, uh, currently, um, to, I'll use the term gangbusters. Um, <laughs> so is going gangbusters right now. Um, there are, uh, and granted, this is in part, uh, in part due to a very heavy demand being placed on online services, um, much more so than say was the case three years ago. Hmm. And also um, to be quite frank, it is very hard to locate, uh, say, I, I'm actually not aware of an undergraduate program in user experience design. Um, and it's even, it's somewhat difficult to find a graduate program in user experience design. Usually these things are cast as say uh, human computer uh, interaction or HCI, um, or, or they might be a division of anth anthropology, or they might be a division of uh, computer science. And none of these are a perfect fit. So it's kind of kind of cobbling it together as you see fit and really expressing a passion to be that active listener and, and an active agent um, on behalf of other humans. Why is this? Why is UX different than regular marketing? What's different? I don't. Great question. So, and I can actually uh, answer this in context of, of one of the key artifacts that we produce. Mm -hmm. So the, the artifact that I'll point to is this thing called a persona. And a persona is basically a snapshot. Um, picture it like, uh, like, a, like a beefed up driver's license almost, um, where you have a little picture that's representative. Uh, you have a little story that tells about uh, this this uh, uh, con construct's life um, or or how they go about their day, and then essential information that you use to perhaps uh, design a thing or pursue a line of activity. So there are marketing personas and there are design personas or user experience personas. Marketing personas are really focused on telling the story of brand affinity. Um, what does this uh, what does this archetypal person like? Why do they like it? What uh, what key touch points might another brand use to evoke their interest? So marketing really has to do with that with that customer interaction, interacting with a, a potential customer and speaking to them in language that resonates with them. User experience acknowledges that yes, if, if we do a good job with the user experience of a, of a product or service, we will most likely get a very loyal customer out of it. But that's not the focus. Um, the focus is uh, what, are this, what are this person's motivations? Um, uh, what are their pain points? How can, how can we alleviate those pain points? Um, what? Uh, are you it, saying pain, P-A-I? Uh, yes, pain points. Okay. Um, so pain points are the way. Where it hurts, you understand about that, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm in a lot of pain when I use this phone. So. <laughs> right, and that's what Robert is trying to solve. Bingo. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So, uh, so pain points. Yes. Um, yeah. It's basically we're looking for for the points in a in say a particular interaction with a product or service where where somebody might um, say be like I don't know what to do or why is this so hard or oh I have to do this again um, it's it's those moments of pause and frustration yes. that we 
or in user experience. And we want to understand as much as possible having to do with those points so that we can we can design around them. We can we can curb the uh, the sharp edges in, in an encounter. And would you say, Robert, that part of the reason that we need to do this is um, this idea of uh, calm technology or invisible technology, there's a lot of onus on the user or like the person that's working on the computer, let's say, to understand how to do things where if you think about a television, no one had to know about a cathode tube or what connects to what, you just turn the darn thing on. And so I feel like for example, with seniors working at the public library, they really, there's, there's a lot of people I think that feel left out oh. and it's, and it's easy to feel like it's your, your ignorance instead of recognizing that this very piece that you're talking about in design and, and, um, cause the persona, right. Is basically a way of fleshing out who that user is using demographics and using a story to fill out the process by which a person would be using something so that you understand it on a human level and can it help design it? Do, do I have that correct? Yes, absolutely. A, a persona's function is, uh, is yes, to collect insights from research um, so as to help the design team or all associated members of the product team empathize with the end user. And we got a little bit to make up for because yeah. we do put a little bit too much pressure and the fallout of that has been a, a people feeling very, um, disenfranchised uh, on a number of levels. I mean, broadband and the, um, and, but also the acuity and the ability with technology. I mean, the, the spectrum of, of the, the usability or a person's ability to actually affect a change or do what they want to do is much broader than one would think. Yeah. And, and I can offer a glimmer of hope, at least uh, from, from my side of the, from my side of the oh, house. Yes, please, um, please do. <laughs> um, and, and I'll point to, uh, so language or the words we use warps reality. And, and this, is a, this is an activity that I have my students do in class. I'll usually ask them to talk openly, just, you know, whatever you think, share it. And I us usually use uh, the topic of private prisons. Um, because this is to make the point of some students will refer to the people in these institutions as prisoners. Some of them will refer to them as incarcerated people. That makes all the difference because one is one version is attributing a near permanent state. Um, and actually we have a great example in Spanish where, where you say esta or es. And S is a more permanent state, esta is a temporary state. We don't have something like that that is so overt in English, but it makes all the difference. In English, we have an implied permanent state, which mm -hmm. is nefarious at times. Mm -hmm. So, and to sort of bring this back to user experience, what I've seen happen um, between the 80s and now is, well, in the 80s, it was all about handicapped accessible, right? Right. So, had, mm -hmm. so yeah, so you had a potentially potentially quasi derogatory term at the beginning of the statement, and that, and then it went to um, it went to accessible, just accessible design. Is it is it accessible? Mm -hmm. And now, the most recent iteration is universal design, mm -hmm. and this is an incredibly positive indicator because we are not saying that we have the normal state and the accessible state, because that's bigoted, um, we're saying that ideally everything should be universally accessible to all people. Which is good for everyone. It's, it's great. And, and language, I feel, is, it, it is a good indicator of kind of where the mental, uh, mental map is, where, where the mental maturity model is. And generally, this is the thing that spills over into, into action, into iteration, into tangible design. Yeah, I just can't let that go. David and I have whole areas that we talk about, right, David? And this goes to the power of this, Robert, like the difference between people experiencing homelessness, which we just did several shows on, and homeless, or enslaved people, or slaves. A noun versus, I guess, uh, uh, is it would be a verb. You're in that, I don't know, is that right? Or an adjective. It's not a noun. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and that same, that same uh, 
uh, when you when you read letters to the editors and stuff, you can see that it just pops out of you the homeless people, and then they usually attach some some sort of pejorative statement. You know, they're there because they want to be there. They're drug users or whatever. That permanent state, rather than the unhoused, which is much more uh, encompassing, and looks at seniors who've lost their housing right. because they're priced out of the market, living right. in their cars, or or from what I know, kids living in their cars with parents, and then families living in cars, right? So there's all of that that you can encompass by shifting the language. That's, that's a very powerful tool we're talking Indeed about. Indeed it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, David, I know that you were thinking about, um, you, you, right before we got started here, you were talking about this idea of, of um, some of the philosophical things that this makes you think of and some of the disruption. Did you want to talk about that? Well, when I was... Uh, teaching in, uh, at Clark College before, before times, um, <laughs> I did a class on AI, <clears throat> artificial intelligence, and I was really gobsmacked about how, the uh, disruptive influence of um, the, uh, ro the uh, robotization of work. We've already seen that you know, in the auto industry and stuff like that and other, other places. But that um, anything that requires a loop kind of system is going to uh, be affected by the, by the uh, integration of AI in that. And people in the job area where they're making twenty to $40,000 are going to be displaced in the next 10 years, 10 to 20 years. And that, then the conversation started to be, well, what's going to replace that? How do we retrain people for that? And that was one of the things I was thinking about when I, uh, when um, Daria talked with me about um, your work is what, what jobs are going, how does that say it? What, what kind of training people are, are going to need to be able to be, have jobs in the next 20 years, 10 to 20 years? And are you doing it right here in Vancouver? Um, right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, to your earlier point, tech fluency is, is I, I don't even look at that as, as an essential job skill. It's just that is an essential skill in general. Everything from- Every paint. time I set up my flat screen TV, I, and it takes two hours, I go, oh, I'm a genius. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like the, the, uh, the quintessential, can you set up a VCR from the lady <laughs> just yeah. magnified a million times. <laughs> right. exactly. um, so in terms of in terms of skilling up, um, I mean, I, I'm biased, and I will readily admit that I will recommend a a fundamental level of user experience understanding for every person, um, just because it's uh, it is it is part of what I broadly refer to as a moral obligation to be intelligent, um, and and I, I borrow that from Lionel Trilling. Um, that's, I just can't get past that phrase. I'm just like, yep, that, that sums it up. Um, because as we grow in our intelligence, we grow in our capacity to associate with one another um, and understand the, the human race more holistically than piecemeal, which is key to, key to the, you know, the, the shining city on the hill that we all want to get to, right? Um, so user experience. I, I also, folks say, I've been hearing things about like, uh, maybe you should learn how to code. I'm not sold. Um, because code is a large undertaking and it is not for everyone. It really isn't. Um, it, it is a particular way of, of thinking in terms of, uh, in terms of structure of information, in terms of how to relate information at its most fundamental level. So if you're interested in that, I very much encourage you to pursue that, to, to have a, basically a fundamental understanding of how the internet and how connected objects work and talk to each other. This is a good thing. Um, I'm, I'm also of the mind that we don't really own anything until we can perhaps take it apart and or fix it. Um, so uh, other than that, let's see. Um, I think, well, how about this? Let's, let's hedge our bet. Let's say, yes, technology is marching on at a perhaps alarming pace. And a lot of things, a lot of job roles are going to be are going to be outmoded, are going to be are going to be retired based on a rise in uh, in a more tech rich or connected world. So what do you do? You might go the opposite direction because uh, 
I'm, I'm going to be hard pressed to believe that a machine will anytime soon be able to I believe pass the, is it the Turing test um, of, of passability for a machine? The Turing test is very hard because there, there are nonverbal cues. There are, I mean, you talk about accessing the computing power of the human brain. You're going to need a quantum processor. Um, yes. Uh, so I don't think that a computer is going to take over the role of, say, an anthropologist or, uh, or somebody who is, who is tasked with uh, environmental conservation or, uh, or other roles that might be much more humanistic in their touch points. Mm -hmm. um, uh, social work, um, uh, what, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, you know, I mean, granted, the field of medicine has a lot of evolution to do very quickly. Um, but, uh, but I think associated rules, roles to medicine um, are, are not going to be, um, are not going to be uh, going the way of automation anytime particularly soon, um, just because that it's that human touch point. The human touch point um, really to have the best outcomes needs to be preserved as a human to human touch point. I mean, think about all the frustration that you encounter when you dial into a phone tree. Oh, I'm getting PTSD yeah. just here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, human to human is what we want. I mean, and uh, actually to point to, uh, to, point to a, another company in Vancouver that has had great success with that strategy, um, and they are down by the waterfront, a uh, large building. Uh, and they specialize in human to human, I want to say business leads, and I forget their name right now. That's okay. You'll remember it before we leave because that'll drive me crazy and everyone yeah. else too. I can, but, I can look it up right and now. And while you do that, Robert, we're when we're talking about universal accessibility and a lot of this stuff, people just zone out at this point. They're like, okay, this is over my head. So can we talk a little bit about you as an instructor and, and what informs you and, um, and, 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 and why coming to you in terms of meeting people where they are? What, a little bit about your philosophy about that? Um, sure thing. Also, that the name of that company is Discover Org. Thank you. Oh, just oh, okay. Yeah, they have. They sort of have mixed um, a mixed reputation. Right. Okay. I, I have, I have <laughs> a mixed reputation on the employee side. Um, right. <laughs> I know their business model. Like it's it's specialized because it puts a human in the in the contact seat with the customer, which is okay. okay. But um, okay, sorry. But they have to treat their humans well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would help. <laughs> that's, that's a touch point. Yeah, right. yeah, that would be a nice pain point. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, um, not to not to tangent too much. Um, and your question, your question, one more time. So, Bye. so in terms of the the idea of accessibility, the universal accessibility, and now we're we're I want to get back down to that micro level. People watching this show who might feel like the. The, the, the jargon are a little bit overwhelmed by some of these concepts. Yeah. But we're, our point is that there is a, a very accessible entry level to come to you. And I wondered if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit about the sorts of uh, philosophies or examples that informs your teaching style. Sure thing. And uh, I'm also gonna misplace this gentleman's name, but uh, I, I, am a, I am a fanboy of this uh, one particular gentleman who, uh, who does Ted Ken Talk. Ken Robinson. Oh, oh uh, Ted, yes, Robinson. Um, <laughs> Sir sorry. Ken Robinson, yes. Sir Ken Robinson, yes, that's the gentleman. He's, he's literally in my, in my course materials because I borrow heavily from, uh, from his philosophies. Um, and the thing that really stuck out to me, like if I was to name one point, that he brings up that has stayed with me is there is a difference between learning and education. Oftentimes in education, there isn't much learning going on um, because, you know, uh, we, the, the systems that we really like checking boxes and we often forget um, that checking boxes is an ambiguation much, much like, I mean, if we're really going to get down to it, language, language is a, is a grand ambiguation. It's weird. And it makes you wonder about, about all sorts of things, but, uh, but check boxes, check boxes to indicate progress. That's an ambiguation. Does that actually measure progress? A checkbox? No, no, not at all. Um, 
And so bringing this into my class, um, I generally do not use tests and quizzes um, because I don't feel that they are a really useful tool. They don't, they usually um, generally, yeah, they are, they are a very prominent tool in education, but do they really help with learning? Well, I do use two of them. One is the midterm and that is heavily written by the class because it's it's a reinforcement tool. It's, I don't I don't care how long it takes someone to complete that type of assessment. I don't care where the questions come from as long as they're relevant. What I care about is we have a body of content. We need to talk about this content. We need to apply some of the science uh, within this content. And we need to do this a few times to, to help with retention. Because retention, if we're going to talk about what learning is, learning is retention and application. Um, and then the only other quiz I give is eight questions. And uh, the video that it's based on is 60 minutes long. And students have 120 minutes to complete the quiz. So if you simply play a video and play the video, you will be able to complete the quiz guaranteed. And it's just, and that's simply to, uh, simply to act as a prompt to critically watch the video rather than put it on in the background. That's the only function. So now for my other tools and tools and methods. Um, so since it's a user experience design course, um, I regard it as, as something that benefits from an immersive experiential element. Now, what do I mean by that? So back to uh, Daria, I believe you, you mentioned this earlier. If we're gonna talk about what, what is design? Because you know you go to Ikea, oh, that's designed, that's designed. Oh yeah, it's lot, lots of design here, right? <laughs> but what do we really mean by the word design? And I'm gonna borrow from Stanford's D School. Um, where I found that the phrase, it's the ability to navigate ambiguity. That's what it is. So in my class, I embrace this uh, wholeheartedly. And, and part of this is I need to get my students to not only understand the, the nuts and bolts of kind of the, the academic or conceptual level of, uh, of user experience, I need them to be comfortable with applying these methods and comfortable in an environment that is somewhat ambiguous that they will have to navigate using these methods. So I do not give all the answers. I, I make myself available and questions are welcome. And in general, uh, the lecture time, my students are invited to make it their own. They're invited to own it. They have purchased it. Thus, in my mind, they own the service that I would like to provide. Now, how do I provide a service uh, to the best of my ability? I ask them what they want, what they need. Um, I encourage them to contribute and tend to steer the class, you know, according to their preferences, according to their needs. And and I create levels of ambiguity that that act as act as prompts, act as uh, provocative agents to to essentially get them get them to understand like everything's going to be okay. We're on the same time. We're on the same, same team. Um, and this is just part of the process. This is, this is to say that this is a safe space in which you can ask questions. Um, there, is, there are going to be levels of ambiguity. The, the point of all of these activities is to make meaning, is to collect, in, collect data, pull out insights, and then have meaning in front of you. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry, that, that, was a, that was a long, long explanation. <laughs> no, that's fine. And just, just quickly, I, I, I want us to talk about that, the, the accessibility and that, that bar when it comes to someone taking a class with you is you, you may or may not have an AA or a BA, or you just have to have an interest, right? Yeah. And they can, because it is Clark College. Yes, um, an interest, and I believe Clark has a few prerequisites, but the prerequisites are pretty, pretty uh, basic. I want to say it's like um, a basic understanding or or basic competency in, in writing, um, and maybe a few other things. Um, but yeah, an interest is is all that's needed, and mm -hmm. not just not just an interest, but if you have a variable schedule, me for accessibility, I don't grade on participation. 
I don't grade attendance. Um, I record every lecture and offer it back with subtitles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I can make most student schedules work. Excellent. What about the job opportunities? Uh, is there anything where like you invite some employers in or you connect them in some way? Um, so for I, I occasionally have a student or two um, that want to pursue UX as as a career path. Um, so I am I am happy to connect folks around. Uh, I also, aside from teaching at Clark College, I also mentor through a boot camp called Design Lab, which is based out of Portland. Um, and and in that capacity, I mentor in the Career Services Division. So if if my students want to want to say tailor their resume um, and create a portfolio of UX work that will that will potentially help them to gain an entry level position. Um, yeah, we can work on that. And, and a lot of it is, honestly, a lot of it is just how you position yourself, how you sell yourself, how you show other people what you are in passionately interested in. Great. And we will include, of course, all of your contact information at the end of the show. So, okay, Robert, the one thing that we talked about, and you mentioned it too in the very beginning, is you live in, in Vancouver. You find the, the COVE cool. You're making the cool, cool the Couve cool and how do you see the future of Vancouver in relationship to these um, these technology opportunities that we're talking about today how do you think we can keep it accessible and cool into the future um, so Vancouver um, Vancouver is an amazing place to live I mean I, I moved here about 12 years ago I have not regretted a single day um, not a single one <laughs> now, part of that is I don't have to shovel snow and I moved from Iowa. Um, okay. <laughs> but uh, so to keep Vancouver cool, really, it's uh, so we we have a good small business structure. Washington, I feel, is much more conducive to to facilitating small business operation than than Portland across the Columbia. Hmm. Um, I, I have a couple of friends who own businesses over in Portland and uh, just hearing what they, and essentially what they have to do to maintain those businesses, I'm like, nope, I'm out. Um, <laughs> um, so Washington just makes it really easy to to start up a business. Um, there's not a lot of paperwork. the The online interface is good. The level of uh, support is great. Um, and and honestly, like we have we have an environment where yeah, you can you can still. Um, rent commercial space for you know less than a king's ransom, shall we say? Um, no, granted, prices are ticking up, and that's something that we have to be aware of. Um, so I think honestly, to to keep the couve cool, um, we do have to, as a community, be sensitive to you know what we've got a good thing going. How do we keep it going? How do we make sure that in the new vision of whatever, and I want to say um, the the academy is slated to tear down a part of that uh, part of that complex and put up um, put up a different structure that I believe is a mixed use structure. Um, now that's just one example of you know progress is uh, progress is is infiltrating the couve. How do we ensure that progress is not at the expense? of affordability of the of the environment that allows uh these seeds of innovation seeds of ideas seeds of business to grow um, because not everyone wants to take out what a hundred two hundred thousand dollars in uh in business loan not everybody has the credit line to do so mm -hmm. um so we need to be conscientious of that and I, this shouldn't become an instance of, well, if we can have a program where people can apply to get the right amount of funding, then we can make it accessible. No, because that that assumes incorrectly, I believe, that uh, whoever is behind the, uh, the analysis of applications has a level of competency and expertise to review those applications and prognosticate, say, 10 years into the future, what is viable and what is not. Um, that's a bad model. Um, instead, uh, we we essentially just need we need the fundamentals. We need affordable commercial space. We need uh, you know what here you know what we really need we need municipal internet. Mm -hmm. That is what we really need because I am tired of Comcast. Mm -hmm. I am tired of CenturyLink. So I, that means community owned, right, Robert? Absolutely. So let's just define that. Okay, yeah. 
community owned because while while the lobbyists on K Street would try and have us believe that internet is not a human right, um, it's a utility now. Yeah, it's a utility. It's a utility, and they're going to fight tooth and nail till the bitter end. But really, we can look at uh, models. I believe it's Chattanooga, Tennessee, gives us a great model. I mean, we can um, a municipality can lay fiber optic cable. Um, you can have internet for between 20 and $30 a month uh, at anywhere between a uh, hundred meg and one gig speeds. Um, mm -hmm. There is no reason that we should be paying uh, what north oh. of 50, northwards of 80, northwards of a hundred dollars per oh. month to maintain broadband connection. And if you're, and if, if anyone's going to say, Oh, well, you can make do with a dial up modem. Yeah. No, no, I don't know a single person with a dial up modem. No. Um, and if we're going to say, uh, oh, yeah, well, a phone can can keep you connected. Well, have you met a Gen Z? <laughs> yeah, right. Have you met a millennial? Do you want to guess how many phone calls they want to make? Yeah, no, no. Um, the kids these days don't want to talk on the phone. No, they're using their phone like a computer. And that's your whole point. Hey, listen, if you lead the charge on this, we'll support you. <laughs> well, um, so that's one of the barriers to innovation is not, is accessibil um, accessibility, universal accessibility to the internet using that a mind shift, a mindset shift. That it's universally accessible. It's a it's a utility. It's a human right to be connected in that way. Yep. So when you were talking uh, in your van talk, uh, your van talk TED talk back in 2016, you mentioned the concepts of uh, I got it here of um, game, storytelling games and neural coupling, and um, those were those kind of jumped out at me. Uh, storytelling is the way we, um, from a psychological background, is the way we make meaning. It's me meaning making, you know, what happened or what's happening, and that idea of using that as a and the persona as a way of understanding user experience it was really uh, interesting. Um, could you say a little bit more about that in relation to the neural coupling and why that's a valuable way to look at sure things? Um, and, and I have a feeling this, I mean, in my mind, I have this picture um, uh, probably of a fishing village. Okay. Um, and I'm closing my eyes. And that, and I... <laughs> picture of a fishing village yeah. uh, from, we're going to go with, let's make it 100,000 years ago. Let's make it a little bit older than we might think. Maybe, maybe older than that. And in this fishing village, um, they, they have stories. Um, and the stories, when do you tell a story? Well, well, you go out uh, during the day or during, during the morning and you catch the fish, bring them back. And then the fish are put over a fire and they're put over a fire to smoke some of them um, and cook others uh, for, for eating immediately. And stories get told as a way to count the time because there's unoccupied time while you're waiting, while you're waiting for this high protein source to essentially uh, to, to get prepared. And, and the stories that get told are, are bucketed into certain lengths of time. And they have, they have intrinsic meaning, they have value. You don't just tell any story in this time. You tell stories that are important, stories about, uh, about you know, how potentially to catch a better, better, bigger, better fish, um, how to avoid being eaten by a larger land mammal, um, which, which mushrooms or berries are safe and which ones are not. So, and it's the, and it's the ability to absorb these stories that, uh, disproportionately impacts survivability. So from then to now, we have evolved this thing called neural coupling. And that's where, <clears throat> I'm gonna use my little brainwaves right here. So when you have, when you have an experience um, and this experience is going into your memory. So you have the experience and during the experience, your brainwaves looks like And then when you go to recall that experience, if we were to look at what the brainwave looks like, it looks very similar to the original wave of the original 
experience. And then when we go to tell a story, something interesting happens. And this is where I think we evolved this as a, as a mechanism to survive by by having a superior data transmission capability between our species. It's when a storyteller is telling a story, their, their brain is replaying that wave of the original experience. And when we watch the an active listener engage with that story, we see the same wave start to play. And this suggests that, yeah, no, this is, this is not a coincidence. Um, this is something that I think has been with us since since essentially the dawn of language, um, which we won't get into because that is a massive and awesome story to tell. Um, but this this is something that is so fundamental to our being and and something that really for me instantiates that I am I am in a profession that is not going anywhere anytime soon because I'm going to go with a machine is not going to be able to produce a brainwave that will be able uh, to translate well into a human, not nearly as well as another human could recall a memory, produce a brainwave, and that brainwave be elicited through storytelling in a listener. So David, that is that um, you actually know about this stuff. So is that neuro mirroring? Because that what Robert is talking about, it. It happens because of empathy. It even happens at the movie theater, right? Yeah, mirror, mirror neurons. I was okay. thinking of the word entrainment uh, as uh, you were talking, Robert, um, and that happens in the storytelling. People begin to breathe the same way, and then, then even recalling the story then sets up that entrainment again and produces those same wavelengths, those neurotransmitters um, start functioning that way, and then it gets grooved into... So um, you tell the three little bear stories with your particular, you know, <clears throat> um, tone and intonation to your uh, children, grandchildren coming up, and they then impart that down the line. That uh, that's just I, 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 it's a fascinating way to talk about adaptability and survivability. It's it's just it's just so critical right now that we find a story <laughs> that we can uh, with a happy ending. With a, well, <laughs> that we go forward with it incorporates technology, right? That yes. uh, the uh, helpful aspects of technology, because we're certainly having a conversation around uh, the uh, the negative impacts and the predatory impacts of technology with Facebook and wow, exactly. all the likes and the dopamine transmitters and how that was researched mm -hmm. and people are making money off of our fear circuitry. And, and behavior modification, which definitely when we talk about integrity ha should have nothing to do with that. So you can see that we could go on and on and on and we would love to, but we probably should wrap it up. And, you know, Robert, we really so much appreciate your time with us here. And um, is there anything else that you would like the people who are watching and, and maybe thinking about going for a career in education in this area? Sure, um, I'll encourage everyone yeah, uh, feel free to reach out to me. You'll have my contact information at the end of this episode. Um, if you want to, say, attend a lecture, I'll recommend the Computer Human Interaction Forum of Oregon, kaifu.org for short. Um, and otherwise, I mean, we're out there. Come on and find us. User experience people love to talk to people. That's our job. <laughs> and we love our job. Reach on out. Oh, thank you so much, Robert. Well, when you when you start doing some interesting things that you want to let people know about, let us know and we'll bring you back. Sounds great. Thank, yeah. you. thank you very much, Daria. And David, thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you all for watching today. Stay cool and stay curious. And say goodbye, Robert, but you're coming back. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you.